So um, today we're very happy to have Nick Vitale visiting us. Uh, Nick was a graduate student here working with Dick on um, uh, galaxy clusters, feedback, and other topics in cosmology. He then went on to currently develop um, as a postdoc, and now he is a Lyman Spitzer fellow at Princeton. He's going to tell us about providing constrained halo energies using SC. Right. Thank you, Marcelo, for the introduction. Um, so I just just put this together, uh, at least some of it, about half of it. So bear with the typos. Um, right. I thought I'd go a little bit uh, further afield from myself, uh, move away a little bit from cosmology, get into some more astrophysics. Uh, but there is still cosmology in this talk, so uh, I couldn't stray too far. Right. So um, just to, to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about, um, it's mostly in the realm of galaxy formation. And so uh, what we generally do is, well, galaxy, galaxy formation is a very tricky problem, but we have a nice set of initial conditions. And we try and go from this nice set of initial conditions here to uh, creating things that look like, say, Andromeda or galaxy clusters in our universe. So this is, this is the problem. Uh, now, you can't do this uh, with uh, you know, pen and paper. You actually have to simulate, because this problem is highly nonlinear. Right? These structures are very, very nonlinear. Um, so that leads us naturally to uh, simulations, which has become a big, big industry in galaxy formation. To give you, uh, this slide is meant to give you an idea of the you know, various consortiums of several people in each consortium working on these simulations that take up uh, hundreds of millions of CPU hours on national machines and it costs a lot of money. Uh, so, you know, there's this, the illustrious simulation, which is a large cosmological box, well, for galaxy formations, 100 megaparsecs. This is the, the fire group here that does more uh, zoomed in simulations of individual halos. And there's also the Eagle simulation, which is sort of, it's a different code than this, but you know, on the same scale and size and resolution. Uh, and these, uh, these consortiums have sort of said, hey, look, we can start making things in our simulations that look like what we observe out there in the real universe, um, which, is, uh, which is a huge step forward from, I think, uh, where things were 10 years ago. Um, but there's still some, you know, I would say uh, messiness uh, under the, or, you know, that's within these simulations. Things that aren't ideal if you care about, you know, wanting to simulate everything from first principles. You can't, you can't actually do that. So when we do this, this simulation starting from initial conditions to try and get these objects, we have to include things that are what well, simulators like myself, we call them uh, subgrid physics. Uh, what that means is some model that you hope resembles physics uh, that is way below the resolution scale that you, you, you just can't resolve in your simulation. So this is something you have to resort to given the limited computer power that we have uh, and resources. Right. So. Uh, an example of that is if you want to simulate a galaxy, you're talking about uh, something that's, you know, several, you know, if you want to do the full halo, maybe 100 kiloparsecs. And if you want to simulate every single star in that galaxy, you need to resolve things down to scales of AU. So you're talking, you know, many, 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 you know, tens of tens of orders of magnitude here that you just can't do. Uh, let alone, it is very difficult to simulate star formation by itself. That is still, I, Chris can say more to that, uh, but that still seems like an, an, an unsolved problem, uh, although progress is being made. So this is where we, again, resort to things like subgrid physics, where it is, where you, you know, maybe in a simulation of this individual halo here, you resolve things down to uh, 10 parsecs. You still can't you have to have some model for turning the gas in that 10 parsecs into uh, 
several hundreds to thousands of stars uh, with some criterion. And that all goes, again, under this, this label of subgrid physics. Uh, a key uh, component to the, this, this subgrid physics models is uh, some form of feedback uh, in these simulations. This happens uh, via star formation or other things that people like to invoke, such as AGN. And that really depends on, on the mass, uh, uh, the mass of the, the halo you're trying to, trying to resolve. Uh, this is sort of an example of, you know, we know galaxies form stars, but when you look at the stellar mass to halo mass ratio as a function of halo mass, you see that star formation isn't that efficient, and that's why people invoke. Uh, forms of feedback. You also notice that there's sort of a feature here where there seems to be a peak uh, around 10 to the 12 and then again a decline in terms of the star formation efficiency as a function of halo mass. And people that do cosmological simulations have taken this, uh, this these sort of empirical measurements uh, as a way to sort of split up the different models of subgrid feedback that they include in their simulations. Uh, well, let's see. You're going three decks here and about uh, two decks. Uh, so. And so the way people have uh, split it up is they say the low mass end, this is all some form of stellar feedback. This is, you know, I'm doing, this is very, very general here. Uh, at the high mass end, there's something that they like to, or they have to invoke, which they call a AGN feedback. Right. So these are sort of the subgrid models that, that people put in to sort of get these various star formation efficiencies. Yeah. At the mass event, if you have, if it's a large cluster with a bunch of galaxies, is this all the stars and all the galaxies, or just the central one? Uh, I think this is this is central, but even if you add sort of ICL, I mean, the, the BCGs really dominate the, the stellar stellar component. Okay. Even if there's hundreds of other galaxies in the cluster. Yeah, I mean, they're not all. So you know, BCG. I think I think it depends on on the actual on the actual object. There's probably lots of scatter in that as well. Um, but yeah, I would say it's probably mostly BCG and ICL, so the intercluster light dominated. Um, you will get there. You probably have like 10% contribution from satellites. Right. I'm giving order of magnitude numbers here. Uh, so you'd say more. Well. He was pointing to galaxy clusters can have thousands of galaxies in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, a thousand times uh, 10 to the 11 is the cleaner. Yeah, but, yeah, but a thousand times 10 to the 11 is a 10 to the 14 in stellar mass, which means you have a 10 to the 16. Uh, I know, but the, uh, yeah, but the central galaxy does not have that kind of content. I mean, it, it can have big content, but not that kind of content. On, on average, they're four times more luminous than the other galaxies in the halo. So, uh, but yeah. Anyway, I would have just said. 50-50. And it's a very interesting question of what the distribution is like uh, in terms of how dominant the central one is. Right. Uh, so where was I? Right. So these are the models that they have to invoke. Uh, this is just, I'm talking about feedback here to try and get the stellar content right. There's other things uh, that are important when you're trying to simulate uh, you know, massive halos and less massive halos. Uh, again, right, there's feedback you have to invoke. There's things like uh, non-thermal processes, which you naturally get out of hydro sims if you're talking about uh, non-thermal pressure from bulk motions and, and 
turbulence, but uh, there's other things like cosmic rays, uh, plasma instabilities that are probably important. On massive halos, they're important at like the 1% level. They're, they're probably more important on, on the, at the lower mass end. Um, you also have to form stars, so you have to have some sort of, again, subgrid model to how you cool this gas and put, throw it into stars. Uh, and the, so that is, you know, your cooling and star formation model. Uh, the point of this is, I mean, this isn't even an exhaustive list, but there's lots of subgrid physics that go into these massive, massive projects that, again, take up a lot of CPU time, a lot of uh, person time uh, to try and see if they can simulate galaxies properly. And it's not clear whether or not, or it's unclear whether or not the subgrid physics models that they throw in are actually any sort of resemble reality whatsoever. Um, back the previous uh, you know, familiar plot of the star formation of frequency versus halo mass. Obviously, the galaxy cluster, you had all the baryons in stars in the constituent galaxies. That's largely dependent on the speed of the, of the, of the uh, halo mass, right? Uh, it's about a percent. Well, okay. So, so I guess this actually answers Alex's question. Maybe the central halo is then about 10% of the total stellar mass. Well, not the central halo. It's the same. You take all the position of galaxies, mm -hmm. right, which have masses, halo masses, say, 10 to 12 or less. So the, their, their individual efficiencies are much higher. Now, not only a fraction of the of mm -hmm. big halo masses and those small halos, but, but are you really discounting by two orders, you know, that 10 to 15 compared to 10 to 12? Because that's what your plot is showing, right? Mm -hmm. like you're almost two orders down by 10 to 15 compared to 10 to 12. Right. Um, so that's a good point. There's probably uh, some sort of radial cutoff here that's not being included. So, you know, if you start going far enough out, you get more and more galaxies. But if you say cut off at something like, R500. I'm not exactly sure where the radial cutoff is here, uh, but that, that's a good point, Chris. It, it probably, if you include all the stars, getting back to Alex's questions and uh, yeah. Dick's comments and then Chris's comments, you're, you're, it's probably more like this if you're including all the stars. Okay. That's what I understand. Sorry. But if you have something like feedback happening in the central halo, it's not necessarily going to affect the satellite halos, right? You're, you're affecting the star formation within that halo. So this is, again, uh, not M star total, but just M star of that specific halo. And if we put in M baryons over M halo, that would one M baryons. If you put in M baryons over, uh, that is correct. Now that is, again, the slope of that depends on uh, where you're actually doing your radial cut. But yeah, uh, you would, we only have measurements really for hot gas, unless you start including these cost halo measurements. Um, but yeah, at the high mass end, it, the, the baryon fraction is, if you include gas plus stars, is, is pretty flat as a function of halo mass. Although, you, you know, there is this missing baryon problem where you get down to groups and you start to see less and less X-ray emission. Uh, so people are wondering where those hot baryons are in, the, in those or warm baryons are in, in those halos. Right. So um, what's neat is, uh, let me just quickly go back here, here. These simulations mainly focus on the stellar content. Uh, which is fine. So they're trying to produce spiral arms and things that you know we observe with in, in the optical. Uh, you know, there's your spiral arms. They're trying to produce ellipticals, irregulars, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they actually make, with their subgrid physics models, predictions for the energetics of these halos. So the thermodynamic properties of these halos, uh, in particular, what the gas looks like, the hot gas. Um, so, th so that's neat. So these are actual predictions. And so uh, I'll be talking about ways we can actually test those predictions. 
And I'll also mention, you know, there are implications uh, to cosmological information. Uh, I'll just, just, this is just meant to summarize them here. But, you know, as we push uh, the power spectrum that we're trying to measure to uh, smaller and smaller scales, we go into the nonlinear regime. And we also start to worry about these baryonic effects from gas uh, and stars on, on the power spectrum that we are going to measure. And this could potentially bias uh, the results by, by a lot. This is one example uh, from uh, Cymbalini et al. They were looking specifically at weak lensing, uh, where they're really trying to push uh, to, to higher and higher Ks. These are just uh, black is dark matter only. Green is uh, some reference simulation, which has uh, star formation and star formation feedback. Blue is they've changed the, uh, the amount of stars, the IMF that they produce at the high mass end. And uh, blue here, sorry, pink is, is that. And blue is when they've included AGN. Uh, so it's basically the reference with some AGN included. And you can see, uh, given these different subgrid models, uh, you're looking at parameters like sigma 8, omega m, uh, w naught. You can see how you just vary your parameters. These are uh, one sigma, two sigma, and three sigma contours. Uh, this is just using, this is, this is a Fisher calculation. Um, but given these uh, p of k's here that they were modeling. So you can see if you don't have the right model uh, for your subgrid physics, you can't really make a prediction for you know, what cosmological parameters you're going to infer from these measurements. So th this is an issue. Well, so that, that is uh, part of what I'm going to do. Uh, in principle, you can try and constrain the subgrid models and then use that to infer cosmological parameters. Uh, right. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to use the uh, cosmic microwave background, which I don't need to explain what it is, um, as, a, as a backlight. Uh, so although when we, most of the pictures we see uh, of the, the CMB uh, look like this, uh, this is because um, some artists on the Planck team have done something with the scale, and they've sort of they wanted to accentuate the fluctuations. In actual fact, it looks a lot like this. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is use the CMB as a, as a backlight and look at the stuff in front of the CMB. Right? And there's lots of stuff in front of the CMB. Right? This was emitted way back at Redshift 1100. Uh, and so what people like to do when they get maps like this is clean out all that, that stuff, those foregrounds in front of it. Um, but actually, those foregrounds contain a lot of information. Uh, especially cosmological inform information, not just galactic information. Uh, and so what's great about the CMB is that you know, we've made very exhaustive measurements of the CMB, but uh, we're still going. And uh, the measurements are getting better and better. And what happens is as these measurements get more sensitive, so we go to higher angular resolutions, um, Modeling these foregrounds and all this stuff in front becomes more and more important, and we also get more information on those on those foregrounds. So, so that's great. Uh, the particular foregrounds, or I like to call them CMB secondaries because I think they contain information, uh, are the thermal and kinetic sinusoidal Dovich effect. So, as the photons from the CMB uh, stream towards us, they go through many epochs in the universe. Uh, one of them is reionization, uh, which I won't talk about. But another one is when our, the actual structure that we see today starts to form. Uh, and what this structure does is it scatters these photons as they, as they travel towards us. This is just meant to, to illustrate the evolution we've gone through so far. Uh, and it's, this is actually uh, a couple years old now. But just in terms of resolution and sensitivity, as we go from experiments like WMAP to Planck to ACT, you can see this is on the same patch of sky. And you can see things really start to pop out, like clusters, point sources, et cetera. Now, the way the uh, TSE and KSE work, I'll just give a 
quick summary is you have your CMB photon come in, it gets Compton upscattered uh, by the hot free electron gas within halos, and that then comes towards us, so it gets blue shifted. And what it does to the CMB black body is it turns this nice, um, this nice, nice black body that's uh, 2.7 degrees Kelvin, and it distorts it. So this is a spectral distortion caused by the, the TSC, uh, which is fairly unique. Uh, and this distortion, uh, G of nu, is proportional to Y, uh, the Compton Y parameter, which is the integrated electron pressure along the line of sight. So that's for a particular source. If you then integrate this over an angular aperture, you're getting basically an idea of the total thermal energy within that halo. This is the distortion. You can see it's a decrement below 217 and an increment above. Uh, I won't mention. This is all non-relativistic, but relativistic corrections are, are small at, for, for the moment. Uh, then there's the kinetic Sinyazodovich, which is Doppler boosting of those CMB photons. So if this uh, hot electron, or this hot gas here, ionized gas, has some uh, peculiar motion with respect to the CMB rest frame, then you Doppler boost those CMB photons, depending on whether or not it's moving towards us or away from us, and you see a temperature shift according to that peculiar velocity. So here you're, you're measuring the integrated line of sight momentum. Right, so this is uh, density times line of sight velocity. And these, uh, these particular effects have been seen in, in abundance now, uh, KSC more recently than TSC. This is just a, a gallery to illustrate the many ways we've measured the, the TSC on individual halos. Uh, this, this is a stacking measurement uh, done by Planck and then a smaller group at Princeton where we looked at stacking as a function of stellar mass. And this is the integrated Compton Y you get within a cylinder as a function of stellar mass. You see there's a nice almost power law-like uh, trend here as you go to lower and lower stellar mass. You still see that there is some form of hot ionized gas within these halos as you get even down to 10 to 11 solar masses. This is showing what the actual shape of uh, the pressure profile looks like. So if you take the Compton Y parameter and you measure it as a function of radius, uh, you can get what, these, uh, what the exact uh, profile is of the hot ionized gas in the, or at least the, the pressure profile of the hot ionized gas within these halos. Um, and these two uh, show measurements of the cross correlation between uh, lensing. So you take the, the lensing mass a lensing map, uh, which is the projected mass along the line of sight. This is using weak lensing. And you cross-correlate it with some sort of Compton Y map, which was uh, produced nicely by Planck and then also produced by some other people as well uh, independently after the fact. And this gives you an idea of the uh, convolution of the total matter profile and the uh, gas pressure profile. And that tells you, again, interesting things about uh, the halo energetics, which I will get to in a second. Uh, more recently, there's been a slew of KSC results uh, starting in 2012 uh, by uh, the ACT collaboration. Uh, so this was led by Nick Hand. This was using a particular, this was a pairwise statistic, and this was about a four sigma measurement. Uh, later. Uh, Planck came out uh, with another measurement, uh, which was using, they reconstructed the velocity, well, they did pairwise, and they also did uh, velocity reconstruction here. So they took a density map uh, of galaxies, and then they used uh, just linear theory to reconstruct what the velocity field is from that density map, and then they cross-correlated that with the CMB. Uh, and you'd expect then because you have the velocity field that you'll get distortions proportional to that velocity field. Uh, so that's what they did here. We did the same thing in, in, uh, in ACT uh, a couple months later. Uh, here we were able to go to, I mean, much smaller scales than Planck just because of the beam. Um, and here this gave us an idea of sort of what the profile of these objects look like. So the, if you reconstruct the velocity, 
uh, then all that's left, if you're measuring pairwise momentum, is what the cumulative electron profile should look like. It's a function of the angular size at which you're, you're cross-correlating with. So that was done by, led by uh, Emmanuel Shen at Princeton and Simone Ferrara. Uh, even more recently, we looked at another uh, KSC statistic. So this was pairwise. This was re velocity reconstruction. This is, this is SPT pairwise. Um, and this is, again, ACT pairwise. This is something else altogether. This is what we call a KSC with projected fields. This is a, like a, a three-point. This is a three-point function, I should say, where you take uh, a density map and you cross-correlate it with a CMB map squared. Um, and that way, because KSC is uh, parity odd, you get rid of the positive and negative uh, aspects, uh, which would cancel out, assuming there's no bulk flow in the universe, which there isn't. Um, as far as we've measured. And then, you know, we were able to then pull out. This is a whole other talk, and we'll get into this. But uh, we were able to actually pull out a measurement of the KSD, which is this. After you subtract the lensing signal from this, you get this. This is the best fit blue. It's the best fit model here. And he's, these are the points with the uh, CMB lensing uh, subtracted from our model. So, uh, if you look at all these, all these measurements, they are all roughly four sigma, uh, even though it's been four years. Uh, what's, what's neat about them is you're, they're showing various KC detections using different experiments, uh, different estimators. And so it was all neat for you know, Planck, ACT, SPT to all show uh, that they could see uh, this KC signal. And they're all fairly consistent. Uh, we recently redid this analysis. That's what this is down here. Uh, and what's neat about this is we actually went really into detail about how we calculated the error bars and said so maybe we underestimated the error bars a little bit here. So maybe you know, we have improved in signal to noise in the past four years. Um, but what's really exciting is this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we are going to. Uh, essentially blow this out of the water within the next uh, year or so with uh, ACTPOL and Advanced ACT, as well as uh, SPT, uh, further generations, SPT, I guess around 3G now, uh, should be able to do much, much better than what we have already. So TSC, we've already gotten very, very high signal-to-noise measurements, uh, but KSC is starting to get there. Uh, in terms of constraining feedback directly, so I, you know, feed, AGN feedback in particular, I said this was a major subgrid model uh, for all these uh, large simulations that are run. Uh, people have tried to observe it uh, directly. So this is, I'm just showing you an illustration of an, an ACT effort here. Uh, this is, we stacked on optical AGN uh, an optical AGN catalog. I split it up as a function of redshift. Uh, and we had the ACT bands here. And we had also some Herschel bands here to really constrain the dust. And what you're looking at here, this is about a three sigma detection, a three, three and a half sigma detection of the residual. I, would, I call it residual because you have to subtract off a dust model uh, measurement of the Thermal Sinyazeldovich from these AGN here. So there's this little decrement that you're seeing here uh, in, in the 150 gigahertz band is, is what you should be looking at. Uh, and we did this as a function of redshift. And you could take these measurements and try and infer the amount of feedback you get from these halos uh, given some model for how that, that feedback couples to the luminosity. That's right. So the, you have some form of feedback that is heating up the gas and making it hotter than the, the, the Compton Y parameter you expect from that, just that, that halo itself of a given halo mass. So, so above the virial temperature of that halo. And that doesn't, um, that isn't counteracted by that stuff that's moving out and becoming lower pressure. Right. So, you know, it, it really depends on how, how you're doing the feedback, if you're just heating it up in place, if you're doing any, any work, like actual uh, pushing on the gas. 
Um, there's also, you know, when you, when, you, when you make a statement like this, you have to have some model for what the mass of these halos are, right? To say you've seen uh, thermal synergized Ladovich in excess of what you'd expect for these objects. So that's not uh, exactly clear that that's what's going on here. Uh, it's not clear you can distinguish uh, thermal isotope from small scale kinetic isotope. Oh, this is this is a this is a stack, though, right? So, Chris, if you just take random objects that have very you know random peculiar velocities, you'd expect them to be zero. No, no. I mean, if I imagine because you have just as many moving towards you as you have moving away from you. You're talking about rotation. I'm talking about submotions But you also wouldn't expect those to line up when you just take these objects and just stack them randomly on the sky, right? No, I mean. Uh, Smaller scale hydrodynamic motions, but then objects and your average mode of hydrodynamic motions in the purest term. It's effect it's effectively the same as thermal. Uh, I mean, so probably much lower in magnitude, right? Well, no, here's the thing. I mean, if there's a part of the cluster that's cooling less than the whole time, right? And you're compensating mm -hmm. that cooling with some sort of hydrodynamic input, some mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, then um, I need, nodded that I was shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> but then you need to have at least comparable energy to the thermal energy you're putting into these hydrodynamic motions. Energy. And then uh, that appears as, as effect, you know, effectively a thermal set, but from random hydrodynamic motions. So you're, you're worried about. Uh, Bulk motions induced by the feedback. Yeah. Uh, but bulk on a small scale, so you know, you're averaging over the, the mean Doppler effect might be zero mm -hmm. because you know some bulk motions in some direction mm -hmm. from some part of the cluster is a different direction from other part of the cluster. Right. But, but this is a one-point statistic. It's not a two-point statistic. So that all averages out to zero. You said you're looking for TS. That, right? Yeah, not not in the power spectrum or anything like that. This is a this is a you take an object and you say what is the low I'm signal. Sure. Will, yeah. okay, but I'm just talking about an effective TS set yes, mm -hmm. from averaging over motions that are not actually thermal. That's okay. okay. Yeah, we we can talk. We, we will talk later. So, but following on to all of this discussion, it goes back to one of the other questions. Um, system is still, you're injecting energy in one form or another, and it may be from turbulent motion, or I think that's a big thing. The system is still governed by the um, uh, gravitational dynamics determined by the dark matter. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, you don't get to throw out the pressure. The pressure knows what it should be doing. And so it's true that it uh, is a modified distribution over a given feedback, but nonetheless, it's a still a built-up pressure, so it's not making a big effect. Um, so the other thing is the, um, uh, the thermal S-Z is associated with um, T over ME, mm -hmm. and the bulk motions are the bulk motions of everything together, and so I don't think it's uh, highly competitive for these objects. Oh, but they do create a one time. I'm yeah. being rusty on this, sorry. Of course, the electron thermal speed is high. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. Well, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I have my fault. Okay. Right. So the idea, a better way to do it, in my opinion, is to combine uh, observations of both uh, the TSC and KSC. So you take, if you have measurements of, say, uh, pressure profile, which in principle is extremely easy once you've done the KSC measurement, uh, then you have a measurement of the pressure profile and you have a measurement of the density profile. Uh, and with these pieces of information, you have basically all the information you need to reconstruct the total thermodynamic profiles of, of, this, of this object. So, uh, sorry, how, do you, how do you get the density profile? So this is from the, the KSC measurements. So in particular, if you have a, if, if you've done the KSC estimator where you, where you reconstruct the velocities, then your, what you measure is actually the, the density, the cumulative density profile of those objects, 
right? Because you measured the velocity. All that's left is you, you need some measurement of tau, basically, the optical depth of the free electrons, right? Because you, you measure some delta t over t, and that's proportional to tau times v peculiar. Again, you've reconstructed v, v peculiar. So, so this is what's left. Right. So you have these. Oh, that's a very nice brown curve there. That seems to have been almost on the fifth point there. Well, that's another talk. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which presumably the speaker is aware of. <laughs> um, so. Of course, he's too modest to point it out. That's great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we decided to try and model the pressure profile and uh, density profile using an old model from. Uh, Ostriker, Bodhi, and Babul, 2005, with some slight modifications. Um, this way, we didn't have to run various simulations of many forms of feedback to get at different pressure profiles, density profiles, et cetera. We could do it uh, very quickly with uh, a nice small Python code. Um, so what goes into this model is you assume that the gas rearranges itself according to some polytropic index. Um, we throw in some non-thermal pressure support because we know that there is uh, such a thing uh, in clusters and in all sorts of halos. And then you also have uh, some model for how the energy is injected, some energy injection efficiency. Sorry, this should be epsilon. Uh, and then the assumptions that go into this model, again, is the gas redistributes itself in some sort of polytropic index. We assume spherical symmetry, which, uh, you know, both of these are not so great assumptions, but I'll, I'll show you some examples of why we think they're okay. Um, we also, the assumption is it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, not with the thermal pressure though, with the total pressure, because we, again, as I said, we know that there's uh, non-thermal motions, or at least bulk motions that contribute at least 10% to the total uh, pressure in these objects. Uh, and then you just match uh, some initial conditions. You know, you say that the energy the final energy has to be in, uh, equal to the initial energy plus whatever energy you've injected, plus whatever additional work you've done to the system, whether it's expanded or contracted. And you also set up the boundary condition that the total pressure has to equal the, the surface pressure at the virial radius. Uh, and you also conserve mass. And with these assumptions and these conditions, you can solve for the thermal pressure and the, uh, the gas density, and then turn these into observables like TSC and KSC profile. Because you allow the gas to actually move, because you're doing work on it, you're adding, uh, you're doing, you're throwing in some heat, so the act, the actual gas actually redistributes itself. Also, um, right, this is surface pressure at our virial, assuming an NFW profile. So, so sorry, going back to uh, Wisconsin's thing. So, if it, if you have 10 10 percent in random motion. Electrons moving around, that's 10 percent additional Y distortion under the thermal pressure. It's, it's not random, it's, 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 it's bulk. No, there is an effect, it's just that the it's delta B is down by M over MP. Right? Yeah. Right. 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 But, right. but that also suppresses that's, that's the, the thermal Y effect. effect. It's down by M over MP. You average over Yes, 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 that's right. That's right. Yeah. right. I mean, Could we have one just at a time, just so that I can? <laughs> I'm following three. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. So you kinetic, were? That's, that is first order of views, mm -hmm. right? That's right. That's right. That's right. right. So you have to drag the proton yeah. to Yeah, no, I'm only talking about first order effects here. Right. Um, so uh, getting back to, I mean, Remember, four sigma measurements of KSC. We're not, we can't start worrying about second order effects. Um, so I said we assume that uh, spherically symmetric. Uh, so uh, we showed earlier on, I'm being less modest now, Dick, uh, that if you take uh, you know, clusters at random and you just stack them however you want, uh, they appear actually to be very spherical in, in gas pressure and in gas density, 
which is not surprisingly. You just need to stack enough. Um, this also shows that if you know the axis in which they're aligned, you can actually start pulling out filaments. Um, but that's not the point of this. The point of this is to look at the black lines here that says, hey, look, it's actually really round. Uh, so assuming spherical symmetry in stacks is, is not so bad. Uh, and then we assume a constant gamma. So I said the gas re rearranges itself in terms of a, a polytrope. Uh, and this, this is uh, in terms of total gamma. So this is the uh, total pressure versus the density to, to the gamma. And if you look at uh, some work we did uh, at the same time, uh, you can see that as a function of radius, gamma is actually fairly constant. So you don't really need to worry about gamma changing as a function of radius, unless you go uh, much, much further out where things become less and less virilized. So uh, given that model um, and given measurements of P thermal and rho, you can then start to extract these three parameters of our model. There's only three. Uh, gamma, which isn't really that exciting. Alpha, which tells you about the amplitude of non-thermal pressure in the system. And uh, again, this should be ep epsilon inject, so the uh, efficiency of energy injection in these, in these halos, uh, which is nice. So we went ahead and did a forecast for uh, advanced act like noise uh, plus boss. Uh, and this is roughly 25 square degrees using uh, 125,000 galaxies to reconstruct the velocities in, 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 this, in this region. Uh, and we use the actual measured um, covariance matrix from Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel Shan's work. And we did some estimate for how well we can measure the, the TSD given uh, the advanced act uh, frequency bands and sensitivity estimates. Um, so these are your, your Fisher uh, ellipses here. Uh, alpha, again, non-thermal pressure, uh, energy injection efficiency, how well you can constrain this constant gamma, uh, which is ridiculously high. Um, these are, there's no units here because this is percentage, so error percentage, so you know, this is 10%. Here we're measuring the energy injection to 2%, which is really nice. Um, the different, so the inner ellipses are one sigma, outer ellipses are two sigma. The different uh, line styles here, one show the total, if you're using KSC and TSC, uh, one could say, well maybe you're only getting these constraints from the TSC, so the TSC alone are shown in, uh, in the, in the dash lines, which means you are actually, we're actually gaining information from the KSC, which is nice. The KSC is adding to this, this constraint. Um, and the constraints are, you know, this is, this is pretty modest with advanced act 2,500 square degrees. You're getting, you know, 10% constraints on the, the non-thermal pressure that's in these systems and a 2% constraint on the energy injection in these systems. Granted, they are, you know, this is a model, but it's still it's still fairly neat that you can actually you can actually go ahead and do this. Uh, is there a characteristic redshift for that epsilon inject uh, um, in the model? Anyway? So these the model, yeah, you can put in uh, redshift dependence. Right now, we're just modeling it at the boss redshift. So we only did one redshift bin, but in principle, you can do uh, epsilon of of z if you wanted to. You can vary it as a function of redshift. Right now, it's held constant because we only have one sample. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess we're seeing it to two percent, so we can start thinking about, and we will start thinking about, uh, you know, as you know, if you increase the survey area, this is going to get nicer. Uh, so we increase the sensitivity. This is also going to get better. So this is something we are actively working on, this is again, very preliminary. But you can, you can add more bells and whistles to this model. You can add uh, the redshift. There is a redshift dependence on, on alpha, which helps break the degeneracy between these two. Uh, sorry, here. But uh, right now, there, and that's, that's fixed, but that's something else we can open up in the model as well. Right now, no, this is just some, it's like two times 10 to the minus five is the, the actual value for epsilon. That's our fiducial value, which is some function of 
basically m star times epsilon times d squared. OK. Uh, moving on uh, to slightly new topic. You can also, so well, just going back uh, before moving on. This is great because this is actually saying, you know, within the next year or so, we could actually place constraints on things like how much energy is injected or can be injected in these subgrid models. Uh, how much non-thermal pressure do we expect in, in these halos? Things like that. And so, you know, these are numbers that, in principle, the these simulations uh, that have been run already actually have in their in their calculations already. And it's just a matter of saying, hey, do you do you match these numbers? Uh, you can say they'll say yes or no. Uh, I'm I'm guessing most of them will probably say no, um, but I think I think that's. Uh, that's fair to say. Right. Uh, moving on, there's been uh, a huge hope of using KSZ to actually constrain cosmology. Uh, I'm showing you just an example using the, this pairwise velocity estimator. So with the KSZ, you're measuring uh, the growth rate of structure. Uh, this is the pairwise velocity estimator here. You can see this is this right here is basically your growth rate, um, which depends on this growth factor. Uh, don't worry about these. These are just uh, pretty standard correlation functions. But this, this growth rate you know, is a function of things like if you modify gravity, this, this gamma changes. If you modify things like the uh, number of uh, the mass of massive neutrinos here, you, you change things like F nu. So, you know, if you, in principle, get very high signal to noise velocity measurements, you can start constraining things like neutrino masses, uh, dark energy, and GR. So that's, that's sort of the idea here. This has been pushed uh, more recently fairly heavily by the group at Cornell, as well as a group in Oxford. Um, so this, this is fairly neat. The catch is, though, you don't actually measure the pairwise velocity, right? You measure pairwise momentum. So what that means is you have to marginalize somehow over tau. You have to know what tau is. The optical depth, uh, CMB photons, uh, uh, through these free electrons. And what this is showing you here is they've placed a prior on tau of how well they think they know tau for those halos, which may not be true at all. Um, but you can see as you go to uh, as you lower the, the prior on tau, you get better and better constraints on things like the growth, uh, growth factor and uh, things like the error bar on the sum of neutrino masses. Uh, so this, this understanding what tau is for these systems where you're measuring this pairwise uh, momentum is, is critically important. And so it's, we're, we're not too far away from where the uncertainties on tau will be one of the leading concerns on the, in the systematic uncertainties or be leading sort of the systematic error budget for these measurements uh, using the KSC. You mean explicitly tau E here? Yes. Right. Yeah. Optical depth to CMB photons from free electrons. I mean, surface densities are, at least in some cases, measurable. Which is tau. Right. Oh, you're talking like lensing. Yeah, yeah. Well, lensing for uh, one element of it, yeah. Sure, but lensing isn't, when, you, when you're talking about the, this pairwise momentum statistic, you don't care about total tau, right? You only, yeah. Yeah, no, specifically tau e. Sorry, being a little cavalier with my terminology. Um, but, I guess you were objecting to this. How does one directly measure tau? Uh, there are ways to get tau from individual objects. Um, uh, so you can use x-ray measurements. Um, unfortunately, uh, with, with x-ray measurements, you are limited to bright objects, nearby objects. It's hard to get 
It has not been done, as far as I know, to get uh, X-ray measurements of, say, things that are similar masses to the uh, BOSS sample, the CMAS sample. So we don't understand what the optical depth is for those. And fortunately for this, unfortunately for these pairwise statistics, you have to push down to much lower masses because you need uh, lots of, you need many pairs in order to beat down the signal to noise. So when I say it's not a direct, that's why direct's in quotes. I mean, you can, you know, maybe with future X-ray telescopes, maybe Erosita will be able to do, push this a little further. But it's really difficult to measure basically the gas density, the projected gas density in these halos uh, directly. So um, sticking with, with the theme, uh, what I went and did was looked at a possible solution to this, an empirical solution. So I went into uh, the simulations that I have and looked at relation, uh, relationship between uh, the average Compton Y parameter observed in an aperture and the average tau observed in that same aperture. Uh, and just plotted it up. And sure enough, there was a nice tight relation, uh, which is not that surprising. Uh, this should say relation. Um, you can ignore this, this, this these, these green points uh, don't actually resemble anything to do with reality. Um, so these are two, the, the, the red and blue points are two different uh, simulations with two very different subgrid physics models, uh, one with, one without AGN feedback. And you can see over this range in, in Y parameters here, uh, you actually get a very nice tight relation that actually is fairly independent of the uh, physics that you've simulated. Which is, which is really nice. Uh, so this means that in principle, if you measure Y within an aperture, you can infer what tau is for that same aperture uh, with, with some scatter. But it's, it's, you know, if you're doing a stack, you know, that's where you win with the mean value theorem. So, so this, was, this was actually really nice, uh, really neat. And it's basically saying, why well, it's not that surprising, it's basically saying that at fixed gas mass, the temperature fluctuations are small. So, so that's not too surprising, at least in, in the massive systems that I looked at. Uh, these, these apertures that I chose uh, were, at least for these plots, um, meant to resemble ACT, so the ACT beam, uh, just because, because uh, I'm part of ACT. So I thought it would be novel to check out those particular aperture sizes. But in principle, you can vary uh, the aperture size, and it doesn't actually do that much. It changes a little bit. But, but not too much. Uh, another obvious thing to look at is to see how well the average tau in, in an aperture traces the, the halo mass. So you'd say, you know, galaxy clusters or at least massive halos are closed systems. Therefore, you'd expect the total number of uh, baryons that you project along the site, along a line of sight within an aperture to be somewhat proportional to the halo mass. Uh, that is true, although uh, the scatter in this relationship is much larger than the scatter in this relationship, uh, which isn't that surprising. This is something that we see uh, in just in general in, cosmo in, in cosmological hydrodynamic simulations. Uh, and also when you change the subgrid physics model, uh, there's much more there's a larger dependence on, on the actual subgrid physics model here, whether or not you're, you have AGN or not, because that really impacts on how much a gas you lock up in stars, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, this is in a, a full solution. If you marginalize over just the uncertainties in the, in the subgrid models here, you, get about a, you can reduce it to about a 5% level. So you're, you can, you know, measurements are li then limited to you know, uncertainties in tau at the 5% level. Be nice to push down to the 1% level, but uh, we're not there yet. Now, this is all done, uh, again, with simulations. Uh, it might be possible in, in the near future to actually constrain this with uh, observations. Uh, this is something I've been talking with, with Alex and Vera and Kendrick about, um, looking at ways to sort of estimate the uh, the normalization of this this relation here with uh, using cross correlations and the uh, 
a patchy tau estimator that uh, Kendrick and Cora developed a couple years ago. So that, that would be neat. Um, we're still working on that, but that's, that's work in progress. So this was a nice, uh, nice possible workaround. Uh, and why, why I find this, or at least uh, measurements like this, interesting is because, as I said, uh, CMB measurements are getting better. There's lots of funding uh, to fund these next generation instruments. Uh, right now, we are currently doing the uh, advanced act full survey where we plan to cover uh, 20, or roughly 20,000 square degrees, uh, completely overlap with LSST, which will be nice if you want to do things like uh, these KC estimators uh, where you have to cross correlate and you need some sort of tracer galaxies, you need some sort of population to cross correlate with. Uh, Advanced Act will provide that by having this nice overlap. I've listed other surveys here uh, that we can potentially uh, cross correlate. What's nice about Advanced Act is it's also funded. Um, and going forward, you know, this is what's going on right now. There's also CMB stage four. And in prep for that, there's also the Simons Observatory. So uh, Simons Observatory is a merger of the Simons Array and Advanced Act. Uh, this is basically all, almost all the CMB experiments at the Atacama coming together. Uh, it's also fully funded. And it's meant to be sort of the uh, infrastructure in the, in the Atacama to get ready for CMB stage four. Um, so that's nice. Uh, all this money is mostly for development and building up infrastructure. And how soon it will be uh, Toronto will be in the Yes. Thanks. Yes, it's very, very exciting. If only you'd come a year later, um, you could ask for money. Um, <laughs> so this is ongoing right now. We're in the Right now, uh, what we're doing is we're thinking about what sort of telescopes to build and how to optimize the science given uh, a budget of $45 million. Right. So uh, that's all I was able to get ready for you in the, in the day that I had. Um, so I've, I've already said this. I guess I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, you know. Current simulations actually make predictions for these halo energetics. Uh, there's uh, another observable, which I didn't get time to go into, uh, which again, uh, these simulations make predictions for. Uh, what's nice is in the near future, we'll actually be able to constrain uh, sort of the thermodynamics of the ICM and constrain some of these subgrid physics models, or even maybe even understand how, you know, how effective AGN feedback is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and looking ahead to KC cosmology, come up with sort of a nice fix to break the, uh, sorry, I should say, this is uh, tau V degeneracy, not tau Y degeneracy, uh, that is mostly independent of subgrid physics and allows us to push the constraints from KC cosmology to, uh, to push them a bit further than we currently, where we're currently limited uh, at the moment. So, thank you. Can you go back to this, the coverage slide with the band tag? Yeah, so LSST is that whole region, and then there's DESE, which is less, right? So I was wondering, um, for the KSC stuff, do you, mm -hmm. would you prefer to, what do you think about spectroscopic versus photometric redshifts? Which of those two right. things would be more useful? Like if you have DESI on less sky, but spectroscopic redshifts? Um, for, for us, I think for the stuff that I'm interested in personally, you care about the small scales. Uh, and when you use a photometric survey, you really wash out the small scales um, because of you, you naturally have some sort of smoothing scale in there that's a function of the redshift uncertainty of your, of your objects. Okay. Uh, so spectroscopic is better uh, for, for the stuff I care about. Uh, so this overlap with DESI is, is really great also, I guess. That, that is critical, yeah. I mean, but DESI also pushes much further up. Oh, I see. Yeah, this, isn't, this is just the DESI footprint in our, in our region. 
But again, it's much more than 2,500 square degrees, which is what the forecast I showed, which is the forecast I showed. It's, this is much more, right? Uh, so 2,500 square degrees is like this little patch here, and then maybe some of this patch here. So it'll be another factor of two improvement on that, just with sheer number of galaxies alone. So root two improvement, and then if you push to something like uh, stage four, then you get even better signal to noise uh, just because the sensitivity goes down. So sensitivity goes up, noise goes down, sorry. Can I just double check that I understand the dynamics or you, you have some feedback effect mm -hmm. as thermal energy into the gas that's in the potential world. It doesn't remove matter away from the potential world because that's to get the gas out of the jungle. So you don't actually unbind mm -hmm. any of the material when you're adding energy. And then when you add energy, the thermal energy goes up because the change in potential energy is very small. Mm -hmm. It's a shallow potential. It's not self-gravitating. So if you're self-gravitating, you have you know, major specific, specific heat. And so you add energy and the thermal energy kind of production down. But here you have an external potential. That's right. That's correct. What is gamma and HSC-Y? Uh, sure. So HSC stands for, I, it's not very highly publicized. Um, HSC is the Hyper Supreme Cam uh, Survey. So this is on the Subaru Telescope. Uh, it's basically uh, a Japanese-led experiment with Princeton involvement. Uh, it's about 1,400 square degrees is HSC. Uh, you're pushing to magnitudes of 27. So the optical astronomers, that number means something to them. Uh, <laughs> uh, for it's, it's a, a, one of its main goals is to do weak lensing. So the, the idea here with HSC is we get to roughly 20, 20 galaxies where we can measure shapes accurately enough to do weak lensing within an, a square arc minute. That's what HSC is. Uh, the gamma field is a, I, I think this is a very famous uh, field that has many pointings of various uh, wavelengths. It's meant to do galaxy formation, and I don't know where the name comes. It's some acronym that, yeah, yeah. Do, do you want to say, Gal Dick guessed it's galaxy assembly mass something. Yeah. Something like that. The G is. Yeah. Galaxy growth strip. Uh, the extended growth strip. Uh, I'm not sure. Do you know the RA or DEC of the extended growth strip? Okay. Uh, it's not the like gamma results are in the pan. It's not yeah. something one's waiting on. Just like kids has expanded a lot um, recently. So, That's right. Um, uh, so a bunch of this data exists. That's right. Uh, most of this data exists. I mean, CFHT, LS exists already. Uh, DES has a lot of their survey footprint uh, filled in. Not to not the full depth, but they're getting there within the next two or three years. So uh, most of this data will be available. Unfortunately, LSST won't be until you know mid 20s, but we'll be ready. All right. So we'll go get. Um, 